speaking of parents, what is the some some democratic schools have a very sort of you know hands off my my kids the the kids when they're here it's their private time and and kind of create a distance for their parents. Uh, others fully embrace it. What what's what's the vibe there? That's a great question. What we're doing is so unusual. So we try to bring parents in in a way that's outside of the time and the space. So we have potlucks and ice cream socials and parties at the end of the year. And then we have several times throughout the year in the evenings, parent circles, hmm. where we talk about self-directed education or nonviolent communication or sociocratic governance and things like that. And then we try and keep everything day to day within Embark in Embark. So mm-hmm. that's, you know, running Embark is them, is the young people. We are at our heart, a youth rights organization. Mm-hmm. So we are trying very hard to keep their voices front and center. So Andrea is the other staff along with me. We really try hard to get out of their space and we mm-hmm. will check each other too. We'll notice it like, oh, that was super adultist of what I just did. Sorry, let me get out of the way. And let me create space that your voice can be first because outside of these walls, your voice is not going to be first. So that's that difficult, you know, delicate dance that we do with parents because this is the young people's space. Mm -hmm. This is the Agentic Schools Vodcast, where you will learn about schools from around the world where children's agency to make decisions about their learning and living is more important than their academic skills. What makes education possible is the satisfaction of psychological needs. So that is what these schools have in common with all others. What makes a school agentic is satisfying those needs particularly well. I'm your host, Don Berg. Hello and welcome to Agentic Schools. I am with Katina Franklin Sweetie of the Embark Center for Self-Directed Education in Leesburg, Virginia. Uh, Welcome. Thank you so much for having me here. I'm pretty excited. I'm glad you're here too. All right. So I like to start off with storytelling. So please tell us a story about someone at the Embark Center who uh, really... uh, took advantage of what you have to offer there, really got great value out of being at the Embark Center. Oh my gosh, it's such a hard, that's such a hard request because there are so many people that I can choose from. So I'm gonna talk about a current member we still have. He uh, he gave me permission to tell his story, but he asked me not to share his name. So he started with us a couple of years ago and our very first trial day with him, he climbed out of, we have a deck on our top level and he climbed onto our roof. And so that was his trial. He was on the roof. And when staff came, because some of our members let us know that he was up there and we asked him to get down, he said no. And I remember thinking, I don't know how this is going to work out. (laughs) This is going to be a real challenge. And so that was kind of what he was like. He really had this sort of, as we like to explain, some of the observations that we have with Embark is when people come from traditional school with all of the trauma that they bring with them, some people sort of, they implode a little bit, like they, they pull it inside and then some people sort of explode out. And so we can see demand avoidance and, Mm. you know, not the greatest strategies for navigating conflict. And so he was the explode guy. And so there were constant conflicts with him in the beginning with other members and choices he was making being safe in the space. And he really, really was struggling in the beginning being there. And so when we would work together about how he could be there, it was things like you could only come in for one hour a day, or you can only come in for a mentor meeting, you can only come in for a class. And so he sort of built himself back up into being able to be in the space full time. Mm. We sort of described it as taking a baby and throwing them into the deep end of a a pool and being like, good luck. (laughs) And so that didn't really work for him at all. And so he did so much work. And so much sacrifice and so much conflict resolution that now he is one of our people that the other kids will lean on. So he's 
very quietly co-regulating along with people when they're having conflict, or he's the person that they ask to bring as one of the observers for a conflict or as a friend to just sit by them. And he's just this integral wise person with our community sharing his experiences, but also really, really understanding what it's like to struggle and go through things. Mm -hmm. And the other thing I wanted to say about him that was so representative of our community was that it did get to a point where we had a full community meeting about what to do. About, <laughs> we, we used to joke about like, what do we do about Maria? Right. right. And so, and everybody in our community said, we want to give him a chance. We want to give him a chance. Like we were given a chance we just know that it's harder for him. And he really is one of, um, everybody at Embark is valuable. Everybody is important with what they bring. But this particular person is really just a shining star of what what he, he did and he worked on. How long has he been there? He has been there, I think, five years now. Okay. So, yeah, he's been here a while. Nice, nice. Yeah. Very cool. And and what was kind of what, what age was he when he started out? I think he was about twelve. No, no, okay. that can't be right. I think he was eleven. Okay. Yeah. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. So so, talk about some of those structures that you that you mentioned that that really came into play in order to to help him become an integral part. Like talk about some of the, you know, the conflict reasons, like, like some of the handling of something, you know, getting up on the roof seems really outrageous in some ways. And so, so what was the process, what was the organizational process to handle those, those issues? That's such a great question. So one of the things that we are really sensitive to at Embark is that everybody is not neurotypical, mm. right? And so there is uh, this thing called demand avoidance. And so when you have somebody that's demand avoidance, hello, I am one of them too. It took me into my forties <laughs> and meeting other demand avoidant people before I realized I am also one, that it's not so, hey, get off the roof. Mm. It is I'm going to make a request of you to get off the roof. And what we use at Embark is nonviolent communication. Mm. So nonviolent communication, to boil it down to sort of a, a skeletal structure, is four steps. So it's observation, feelings, needs, and a request instead of a demand. And the feelings that we feel are sort of that check engine light of something's up. I have a need mm. that's not being net met, right? So in this case, when he was up on the roof, it was, hey, I see that you're up on the roof. <laughs> you know, an easy observation, right? And I feel scared because I really value your safety and I have a need for you to be safe and for our community to continue. If somebody calls the police or if you fall and get hurt, that's, I mean, we care about you first and foremost, foremost but that, well, we're going to lose our liability insurance for sure. <laughs> and that will also definitely impact our reputation, right? So now I'm going to make a request of you to get off the roof, right? And so he did. It, it took him a bit, but he did get there. It, if I, I'm pretty sure if he were sitting here with me and I had said, hey, knock it off, get off the roof, that wouldn't have gone over as well as these are the reasons behind this request. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we work on, you know, pretty much there's, you know, conflict everywhere, right? And so being in a community, we, we navigate conflict. And so you'll hear, you know, you'll hear other people say things like, okay, I have a need for this, or this is a value of mine, and this is how I'm feeling right now. Can you please not yell so loudly or maybe not run through the hallway that way. So mm -hmm. that's how we do our conflict resolution process. So we encourage everybody to work it out on their own first. Mm -hmm. And then if that's not really working, anybody that feels comfortable being a mediator can be a mediator. So it's mm -hmm. not just staff that can mediate conflict, but it could be other people. So this person that I was just telling you about is a <laughs> well sought after mediator and and he does, you know, he does come to the table for it. And so, but there are other people that do it as well too. And then if it ends up getting bigger than that, then we do have a bigger meeting. And the meeting that we would have would be sort of a restorative justice style circle. So staff are there, 
The two people within the conflict are there, other members that want to be part of the conflict resolution that have been practicing it and studying it, but also people that are observers with what happened. People can mm. bring a friend with them. And then what we do is we have person A and person B. We don't have, you know, it's because everything comes from somewhere, right? It's not mm. black or white. And then we have people just like I was saying with nonviolent communication, do their observation, tell their story. And it's really hard to tell a story without evaluations or judgments. And that's that's one of the things that, that we kind of have to swing it back around sometimes, which is one of the bigger challenges. But once we get through that, each person telling their story of what their experience was, and then saying, well, this is how I felt, because these are my needs, then we can get to that place of, how do we be in space together in our community? And we do that as a request as well. Mm -hmm. Right on. And do you have sort of typical in, in democratic school environments is uh, some, some way of making collective decisions together, you know, democratic process to do that. Do you have similar set up? Yeah, we are also democratically run, but we use a form of democracy called sociocracy. Oh, cool. So yeah, sociocracy is not majority rule. So mm -hmm. we do it based on consent. I even drew you a little <laughs> of how it works. Hopefully, oh, it looks like it's backwards on my screen. Um, but this first circle here is your zone of preference, right? Okay. And then outside of that is your zone of tolerance, and then is your objection. Mm -hmm. So we, we strive to integrate the objections into the decision so that everybody has a voice in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I have a good example of it where we ended up not choosing what the proposal was. So somebody said, hey, we should get an axolotl, you know, those little water yeah. salamanders. And everybody was like, woohoo, and they raised their hands. And if majority rules had been our method of governance, we all would have won, right? And so one, we had one objection. And so when we, we do it in rounds, so everybody has a chance to speak. And that's, that's the first stage where we flush out the proposal. Everybody has a, a voice in it. And so this one person was like, well, who's going to feed it on the weekends and who's going to take it to the vet? And is it legal to even have one? And who's going to clean out the tank? Because I don't want to touch that poop. And then as soon as that person started talking about it, everybody kind of came down and they moved out of that super excited zone of preference and they moved out of their zone of tolerance into objection to, so mm -hmm. we didn't get an axolotl. Another one we had was we have a part-time option to at Embark mm. and we used to have it set. You had to pick your days. So mm. let's say you part -time, were part-time and you only could come on Monday and Wednesday. Well, somebody came in with a proposal and said, well, why can't we just come whenever we want, but only up to two days? And so there were a bunch of objections because people were saying, well, what if there's too many people on a certain day? And what if you made a commitment to a volunteer that's teaching a class? Mm. And those were these objections. And so what we ended up doing was coming up with when everybody had a chance to flush it out and speak about it. All right, well, maybe you'll come, you'll make that commitment to the volunteer and you'll be there for that day, but then you can pick a different day if you don't have a commitment that you need to honor. And then we moved the objections into zone of tolerance. So it wasn't that everybody was super excited about it and it was their preference, but they were willing to try it. Mm -hmm. And that's a big part about sociocracy is it's good enough for now, safe enough to try, and you can always come back and fix it. So mm -hmm. if you find mm -hmm. that it's not working, you can bring it back to the table. Nice, nice. And that also sets up that sort of feedback that that it's deliberately designed for the feedback of, first, we're going to we're going to listen to the initial reactions, but then we're going to have the feedback. And, and then a decision will be made or, or a you know, something will be tried, but then there's a deliberate design of come back and, and review and see how it's going, right? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And so sometimes the decision can't be made then. Right. So we recently had ants. We had an oh. ant problem because people weren't cleaning up after themselves. And each person at Embark has a cleaning job and people mm. weren't doing their jobs. So we had, it's very rare, none of our programming is compulsory. So if we have something big, somebody can call a mandatory meeting. And so somebody called a mandatory meeting about the cleaning. Mm. And so we had a great big meeting about it. And 
all the people at the meeting didn't want to be part of the problem solving of the cleaning. They all sort of gave their feedback, but they didn't want to put together the proposal, but seven people did. So seven people volunteered to be part of a cleaning circle. So the bigger community meeting circle split off into a smaller cleaning circle. Mm. So that group on their own worked out a proposal of what the cleaning would look like. And then they brought it back to the next community meetup that we had to pitch this proposal, get feedback from anybody, and then we voted on it. And our voting is either consent or objection. And so since there were no objections, it passed through. So cleaning is in the domain of the cleaning circle, but if it changes in a way that impacts the wider community, it comes back to the big community circle. Okay. And how big is your community? How many like staff, students? So total, we have 29 staff and students. We call our students members because we're trying to move away from the schoolish way of thinking. Sure. <laughs> and then we have about 13 different volunteers that come in and they they teach different classes and they lead different you know workshops and things like that. But the governance is within the staff and the, the members themselves. It is small, smaller than other schools. And we don't want to go past 30, 35 members because then... As you can imagine, sociocratic decision making becomes a lot heavier, a lot harder to do. Mm. So we we work well within that small framework. And and what is your age range of members? Right now we're ages ten to eighteen, and we mm. had had a six year old for a little bit, um, but he was sort of on his own. The next oldest person was twelve, and so when we got feedback from him that he didn't want to return to Embark Community Meeting, came up with another policy, which is. The, whatever our youngest member is, we can accept somebody one year younger than that down to six years old so that that mm. person doesn't feel so alone. Even though people really don't know each other's ages, we're totally age mixed. We don't segregate anybody by age at Embark. But if you're the only six year old, it can you can feel it. Kind so, of obvious. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I know in uh, in some other schools. They, well, specifically the village free school at the time when I was doing some work with them years ago, um, is they just, they set, they, they ran from, I think, five to 18. But what they did was that they found they wanted to maintain a certain balance. So they set some ratio limits mm. so that, so that they would have, you know, they could be heavy on one age group, but they couldn't like, like you couldn't just de-enroll all the teenagers or whatever, or the youngers either way, you know, it can go either way sometimes. Yeah. And so they, they just set some, some boundaries around maximum number of, I think it was the first one they had to maximum was the youngers. Mm -hmm. And then eventually I think they had to maximize, you know, had a maximum on their teenagers or something. But, but, you know, those dynamics change over time. So they, but that's how they did it was kind of ratios, but that's an interesting solution too. Yeah. Um, yeah. I like that one. We tried that one too, with a cohort of ages mm, mm -hmm. and then, but then this is our current policy. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that's, that's another aspect I think key aspect, I think of a lot of these centers is that this is what works for now and it's nothing mm -hmm. set in stone. So. Yep. Very and it cool. changes through the years because right. people change and their needs change. So we, we are very flexible. And so sometimes it can be, it can be a little challenging to explain how things work when we know that a new group of people can come through and say, Hey, why don't we try this? What do you think about this? Right. Right. Now in, in your center that like, are there, are there, like code words and special jargon that you've developed that 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 seem interesting, like might be might be interesting to others. <laughs> uh, okay, we do have a great one. So when somebody says something weird or there's a weird phrase, hmm. somebody will say, "Oh my gosh, that's a band name." And so we have chalkboard walls in a lot of places in the building, and one of them is filled with bizarre band names of all <laughs> these crazy things that people will come in and say. And so we've had adults come in for tours and to meet with people, and they'll say, "Well, I've got a band name," and some of the members will be like, "Sorry." you're not a member here, so you can't write a band name up on the wall. <laughs> so yeah, we have that. I think one of the cool things really to hear is overhearing people talk through the process of nonviolent communication, and I don't think they know they're doing it. So oh. we have a Minecraft communications 
class, which is really fun. I When I first got to Embark, I was still working on my own de-schooling, even though my kids never went to school and I was mm. one of these rebel teachers within school. I got there and I thought, let's have this Minecraft class and we're going to build Pompeii and we're going to blow it up. And nobody wanted to do that in there. They really just wanted to play Minecraft together. So I like playing Minecraft and I'm playing with them and then conflicts would arise, you know, so-and-so would spawn like 6,000 unlimited chickens. And then, you know, the whole server server would lag out. And that was this incredible opportunity to practice conflict resolution within a game. Hmm. So now you'll hear them say things and, you know, they'll say, well, you know, I have a need for peacefulness or I have a need for the game not to be lagging out, you know? And so is there a way we can navigate this together? And so that's, that's always great. We tell people, parents that really what Emberk is, is a place to be in community with people and mm. to learn and grow about, about who you are and what it's like to be with other people. You can get all the academics. You really can. That's easy, mm -hmm. right? But learning how to collaborate and be in space with somebody that you really don't like and how, what that looks like. We are in an old home. So mm. our building was built in the 1790s. Wow. So it's this really cool old house in downtown Leesburg and people can walk into town and things like that. So it doesn't look like a, a school at all. And people have freedom to move throughout the building. But it's still, you know, we've got 29 people there, so you're not going to get your own room. So how do you navigate being in this space together? So it is kind of cool hearing that. We're very, very respectful for LGBT community, and we want to build more diversity in our community. So we had somebody recently that was really struggling with being in the space with somebody that he didn't like. And so he was in a, he ended up having a meeting with staff and his mom about this which is unusual. We usually try and work it out in house, but this was, mm -hmm. you know, bigger. And so he was talking about how much he couldn't stand this person, but he kept pr correcting himself to use the right pronouns. Mm -hmm. Right. So he was like, I can't stand this person. And then say, said the wrong pronouns and then he fixed it. And I thought, Oh my gosh, <laughs> you know, this is amazing <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, mm -hmm. that he's doing this. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it does have its, its own culture and, it's interesting when our people go out into the world and, you know, when they graduate and move on and things mm -hmm. like that with this, these conflict, you know, negotiation skills that are just, you know, different. Right. We've right. had, you know, we've had kids that have come from school and they've begged for detention. They're like, just give me a detention because <laughs> I don't want to do a restorative circle. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. I don't want to talk about my feelings and needs and I don't care about their feelings and needs. Just give me the detention. I'll do the time and then I'll come back in and we'll pretend nothing happened. And we're like, Oh, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. It's interesting. So, so, uh, how how when was the Embark Center founded? Like, how old is the school? So we were founded in twenty seventeen. So we're in okay. our seventh year now. Seven years. Okay. Very cool. And and speaking of parents, what is the some some democratic schools have a very sort of you know hands off. My my kids the the kids when they're here it's their private time. And, and kind of create a distance for their parents. Uh, others fully embrace it. What, what's, what's the vibe there? That's a great question. What we're doing is so unusual. So we try to bring parents in in a way that's outside of the time in the space. So we have potlucks and ice cream socials and parties at the end of the year. And then we have several times throughout the year in the evenings, parent circles, mm. where we talk about self-directed education or nonviolent communication or sociocratic governance and things like that. And then we try and keep everything day to day within Embark in Embark. So mm -hmm. that's, you know, running Embark is them, is the young people. We are at our heart, a youth rights organization. Mm. So we are trying very hard to keep their voices front and center. So Andrea is the other staff along with me. We really try hard to get out of their space and we mm -hmm. will check each other too. We'll notice it like, oh, that was super adultist. What I just did, sorry. Let me get out of the way and let me create space that your voice can be first because outside of these walls, your voice is not going to be first. So that's that difficult, you know, delicate dance that we do with parents because this is the young people's space. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But you, you, yeah, yeah. And then there's a certain amount of like when, when the issue rises, 
you welcome them in and 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 have the conversation but it's it, it is and and so so how do you talk to parents like like or even random person on the street you know preferably somebody who might be interested but but like how do you approach that conversation how do you in, introduce somebody to what embark is when they're not familiar at all oh my gosh so that has definitely evolved for me through the years because i used to be scared to talk about what we do because it's so unusual. And I didn't want people that are mainstream school people to, to be offended or angry about what we do because it's mm. different than traditional school. And sometimes people can get defensive about something like that. So when we first were doing our messaging, we really leaned into we're an alternative to school. We're not school, mm -hmm. right? And then we sort of leaned into the self-directed education part. But what we have found is that truly we are a democratic organization. We are a youth rights organization. So now yeah. I feel so brave and so bold that I can say, yeah, we're a youth run democracy. The, the, they run it with us. Everything from cleaning toilets to the budget and board meetings. And if they want to do fundraising, everything is consent based. There's nothing that isn't. And it and we use restorative practices and nonviolent communication. It is so different than traditional schooling. And what I said to you earlier is one of the other things that we say a lot. You can get the academics. It mm -hmm. is a different world now. We don't have to be Renaissance people anymore. We mm -hmm. really can do that deep dive into that thing that we're super passionate about and super excited about. And if you want to go to college, now colleges are starting to look for that in applications. Right. So I've been doing a lot of you know, college admissions webinars mm -hmm. and things like that. And that's what they're saying. They're saying, we want to see people that really focus on something because you don't need to know everything. You can access everything, but you need to know what's real and what's not real. And you need to be mm -hmm. a, a problem solving kind of thinker and a creative thinker. And that's what, you know, we do that's, that's different and it's natural. It's not in any way artificial or forced. Right, right. It's just part of being in our space. Right. Yeah. It's like uh, the contrast, like for me, I was very traditionally schooled. Uh, in fact, going to a, a a magnet program, so college prep, you know, being bused to another school. But, you know, I was the president of a club and my friend was the president of his club and he was the vice president of my club and I was the vice president of his club. And <laughs> what does that really mean? You know, <laughs> it, it was, you know, jumping through the hoops kind of stuff. Uh, but it was all about you got to have a few things to put on that college application and, and it worked. Uh, <laughs> I got into an elite school, so. There you go. <laughs> um, but we've also had people um, get into an elite school without all those things. Exactly. Too. Yeah, exactly. you know, um, and so um, we recently had somebody where she applied to Georgetown and um, they wanted her SAT scores and she had never taken the SATs. And she, so we're here for you to, to support you even after you've graduated, right? So she mm -hmm. calls us up and she says, oh, can I have a mentor meeting? Can I talk to you about this? And And so her big dilemma was, I don't want to take the SATs because I think it's inequitable and I have some ethical issues with the SATs. And she had also done community college and gotten her associate's mm. degree. So she was like, oh. I'm already demonstrating that I am college ready. So I don't see the point of taking the SATs. So one of the things that we talk about with how we run Embark and what I said with, you know, our conflict resolution is what are your choices, right? Mm -hmm. And so what we said to her is, well, if you choose this, what will then, you, what are one of the possible consequences? And she said that they will just reject my application. And we were like, yeah, is that something that you're willing to risk? And she said, absolutely. And so she, she sent them a whole, you know, letter about what, what her reasons were and they still they still accepted her without her SATs. Nice. So, nice. yeah. So and and that's the other thing we and not everybody has to go to college. I mean, and it is totally fine. And there's so many wonderful things you can do in the world. And that's that's a big fear that we find in our area of the country. And I, there's probably probably every area of the country for parents like, oh, my gosh, you know, what if they're not successful? And the only way they can be successful is to go to college. And you still can't. Right. You really, really can. Yeah. 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 What are some, are there other sort of the mythologies about education or schooling that, that parents, that, that, that you run into with parents or just the general public um, that sort of get in the way of them embracing Embark? Oof, yeah, we definitely get into that. 
So one of the ones is the accredited diploma. Uh-huh. <laughs> they want that accredited diploma. And so we are a little different than some of the Sudbury schools and the democratic yeah. schools and free schools that we don't give the diploma. So people that come to Embark Center are registered as homeschoolers. This is how we can have oh, our okay. program in Virginia. And we don't take attendance too. So that allows people that freedom and to have real true self-directed education here in our state. And so they get a homeschool diploma, which can take you to all of the same places, right? right? And so sometimes I feel like a snake oil salesman when I say that to people with kids that have really struggled. Like, Mm. you know, they've dragged them out of the car, kicking and screaming to get them into the school because that's what the school told them. And I'm like, oh, well, you know, here you can create your own transcript and Mm. your diploma doesn't have any regulations on it you just when you feel ready to graduate you're ready and your family issues the diploma we show you how we walk you through the whole thing we Mm. help you write your transcript so we're there every step of the way and the transcripts are my favorite one of my favorite things to do as sort of the admin part, because it's so cool to sit down with somebody and be like, okay, so you've been doing Dungeons and Dragons the whole year. Mm-hmm. Let's go into chat GPT and just write Dungeons and Dragons English class name and see what we come up with. <laughs> and it's like character development and plot design. You know, through, I was just doing this today or mathematics and engineering through video game comparison analogy. You know, it's just like these great things because that's what they're doing and that's what they're passionate about. Mm-hmm. So that could be hard for parents sometimes. But the more that we've been refining our message of the democratic youth governance, we're getting more and more people that that's what they're looking for. Mm. We still get people where their child has been through a lot of pain and suffering in school. And those families can be a little harder to, to have this conversation with because what they experienced was so painful. Right, right. And then we're sitting there saying, you don't have to do that anymore. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so sometimes people feel like, well, I wish I had known about this, you know, four or five years ago, and then I wouldn't, my child wouldn't have suffered so much. But what we say is we're here right now and let's just go from here. Right. And then another one is if they really are stuck in the, I want the accredited diploma and I really want my kid to go to school or sometimes it's the young person themselves. They're, they have a mm. fantasy of what they what they want high school to be in uh-huh. particular. It's usually high school, right? We, we do ask them to reflect on what their reality is mm. and what their fantasy is. And then just sort of think about those things because that's where the, the, the decision is, right? But it's also where that, 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 you know, conflict is within themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, um, so that's one of them. We definitely get the math question. What about math? You know, what about STEM? And uh, I like video games. I'm into video games. I don't play a lot of them anymore, but I used to really play them a lot. And my favorite is uh, just sit with any video game player Mm -hmm. and watch the math they're doing in their minds super fast because they can't pause their game and be like, oh, let's do this equation of how much health I have and how many hit points I have left. And I have this boss and he's got this and he's got that. And there's no way they're going to do that. Right. So they have to process this super fast. But if I were to say, you know, you're really good at math, they would be like, no, I'm not. I'm terrible. And so I'm like, no, no, no. And then we, we have a lot of people that were really into baking one year, right? And there's, mm. They were baking everything. It was fantastic. It was so many Rice Krispie treats. And so this one young woman was like, well, I'm terrible at math and I hate math and I have all these feelings about math. But if you were to, to Andrea actually did this. So she wrote down the equation of what this person did when she made the recipe all in one third. You know, and she's like, oh, hey, look at this equation. Do you think you could do this? And she was like, no, this is horrible. And she's like, so you just did it <laughs> right, with right. the brownies or you're doing it with the quilt you're making or you're doing it with the shelf you're making. So that that math is is really there. I, I mean, I'm a musician, too. And so we had somebody one year that he was like, well, I really, you know, I, I'm not good at math. And I'm like, you're a drummer. <laughs> you live math. Math is in your body. <laughs> And then if people want more math, they can get it, right? And so we we do have people that'll say, you know what, I have this goal I want to get to, and now I do need some math to get there, right? Mm-hmm. And so staff's there to help them. Other members are there to help them, help them get those math skills. And they can because they're ready. 
right? They want it. So they might not be super excited about algebra, but they're super excited about being a veterinary technician. Right. Right. So they're willing to do it. Then they have that internal motivation, right? That self-determination theory. Mm -hmm. And so they have the internal motivation to do it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, definitely math is, is one of the big ones. And what I like to say to people is that I don't, you know, I was one of those people that felt really bad about math. Like I was terrible Mm -hmm. at it, but it wasn't that I hated math. I felt shame about math, right? I felt a deep sense of shame and embarrassment and fear because when I went through school, I was one of those kids that was being pushed further, right? Or I couldn't do the timed multiplication test when I was 11. So I missed recess almost for an entire year until I could get that test going, right? So then it was, I'm bad and I'm terrible at math, but then it was, I'm bad and I'm terrible as a person, Mm -hmm. right? Instead of it just being, oh, well, you know, maybe, the times multiplication test isn't your thing, right? right. Go catch a snake <laughs> you know, yeah. instead. Yeah. yeah. So, so, so are, are you a co-founder of the Embark Center? No, no, actually, I was about an hour and a half further south, and I was in the process of starting a Sudbury school. I oh. really wanted to start a Sudbury school, and I had been to Sudbury Valley and Arts and Ideas and South Jersey Sudbury School, and I loved it. I loved visiting them and spending time with them. And Andrea, at the same time I was part of trying to start the Sudbury school, she was starting Embark Center for uh-huh. Self-Directed Education. And my children, who at the time were, I believe, 11 and 13, um, and they had never gone to school. So my husband and I felt strongly that school is your choice mm-hmm. and you should be able to choose that from, you know, four years old, right? So we always ask them, you know, do you want to do this? Is this important to you? Do you want to try it out? And they'd always say no. And I would, I was still teaching in school at the time. I was a band clinician. So I was your person that came in and worked with your clarinet section and stuff like that. So sometimes they would come with me. So they got to come into school and see what school was like. And it was banned and people want to be in band. (laughs) And my kids are like, why does, why does everybody try and get out of here so fast? (laughs) And so they weren't getting any younger. Right. And so it was taking me a long time, 18 months to start the Sudbury school at this point where my my oldest kid said to me, hey, I I don't want to wait for this any longer. You Mm -hmm. know, I I really want to be a part of a self-directed education community. And um, so I called up Andrea and I grilled her. You know, (laughs) I was like, "Okay." Uh, Is this a real self-directed education center? Like, do you have a secret agenda in there? Like, can they play video games all day? Can they sleep? You know, can they, um, you know, how does this work? You know, how does this all work? You're going to make them do math. And, and so Andrea had said to me, she was like, you know, no, no, we don't make them do anything. And then, and then she said, would you ever want to work at a place like this? And I started to cry and I said, yes, that's my dream. That's what I want to do. So I shifted. Mm because it's hard. It's hard to start a school. It's hard to start a center. There's so many things that go into it. And I kept getting tangled up in different, you know, regulations and zoning and Andrea had already taken care of all of that. So we, we went that direction. It's nice. nice. Yeah. I know yeah. how hard it is because I homeschooled other people's kids for about five years in here in Portland, back in the late nineties into the early two thousands. Um, started and crashed the program multiple times. So yeah, uh, yeah, I know, I know how it goes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It was, e- it was easier when somebody else had did it and I just go there. Yeah. Right. 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 So, so actually, but that does raise, raise an interesting question. You know, you, you, one of the things you mentioned when you were concerned about someone on the roof is insurance. Mm. So, so are there, what is, what is Embark's relationship with sort of states and, and local municipalities and things like that? It, like, do you have, people you're interacting with and they, they get it or, or are you sort of putting up a facade to. (laughs) Oh, that's a great question. So we are a homeschool resource center on paper. We're also a nonprofit. Mm -hmm. So we have had so much support from the community. The very first day we were open, people left 
and they went in this walk in town and I think they went to a playground and, and the police came, somebody called the police. And so <laughs> this, this police officer comes in and he was like, what's going on? I, people, kids, kids are leaving this building and walking out of the building. They sh- why aren't they in school? And so Andrea explained what we were and what we do. And this police officer goes, oh, wow, I wish this had been around when I was a kid. <laughs> and so, and so that's what we end up getting from a lot of people. I yeah. wish this had been around when I was a kid. And we haven't really run into anybody that hasn't been excited about what we do. We're the only one like us in Virginia, which is such a bummer. So people are kind of, you know, proud of that, that we're part of our community. I was joking around with some of the members with our social media account. I was saying, you know what we should do? We should go to all the stores that you guys shop at and do a, who are the people in your neighborhood from Mr. Rogers? And then of course they're like, who's Mr. Rogers? And then I feel really old, (laughs) but but yeah, so far everything is, is great. So yeah, we, we are a homeschool resource center and that's how we are you know, functioning here. Mm-hmm. We love being a nonprofit. We have need-based financial aid for people. And that's been really helpful for some families. We really want to build, you know, financial diversity as well as all the other diversities too. So, right. So, so how, how, geographically wide do you draw from like is it oh, is it pretty far yeah it's pretty far so we're in uh loudon county which is sort of the northwestern part of virginia and we have people coming from fredericksburg which is about two hours away wow. we have another person coming from maryland and they stay they they do like a short-term rental Mm. it's and um, we don't want that that's not what we want we would love every community to have a place like us Mm -hmm. Mm. it's it's we're grateful for the people that come to us from far away but we recognize that's such a hardship and a sacrifice for their families and we're grateful to the parents that drive and the carpoolers yeah so we we have we have local people they can ride their bikes in or walk in but then we have people that travel an hour or more wow Yeah. yeah yeah That's interesting. Do do you aspire to replication at some point in the future? Oh, that's another great question. So at this point, we are so happy to support anybody. So send me an email if you want to start a center, if you want to start a school. I we are here for you. Andrea was a founding member of a Discord server for self-directed education facilitators. So Mm. if you need that information, please send me an email. I will get it to you. We don't want to replicate us Mm. because it takes so much just for us to run Embark Center. Mm -hmm. It, It feels overwhelming to start another one right now. And the other thing that's really interesting is if we were to do it within our nonprofit, within the umbrella of that, it would push our revenue over a certain number and then we would be audited by the IRS and we don't want to go through the auditing process. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> That's a lot, but we do have other centers like us. We used to be part of the Liberated Learners okay. Network. And so I know that Raritan and Princeton and the other one that I forgot, they were all, they're under an umbrella. So mm. they have to do the, the nonprofit auditing. So mm, we would okay. like to not do that, yeah. but we're here to support you. So if, if this is something you want to do, we, we would love to help. Very nice. Very nice. Yeah. Um, so liberated learners, um, have, you know, is sort of a network of, of centers. Arrow has resources for starting things. Yes. Agile learning centers is one that that has resources and and is willing to share those are the ones that come to mind Mm -hmm. and when i was working with the sudbury schools they were also really really helpful too i i bought that sudbury school startup kit right and which was great but the actual centers the actual schools the ones that i reached out to they were very very generous with their time and and talking to me about what their experience was starting their school. So yeah. I think this is a really supportive community and I'm excited to see like Alliance for Self-Directed Education right. and more and more people coming together to support each other. And the Discord server that I was talking about for self-directed educator facilita- facilitators, that's a wonderful place just to be with other people to talk about, hey, this kind of came up at our center and mm-hmm. and 
how did you guys navigate it? Did you ever have something like this happen? And it's so it's a place where we can all care for each other and support each other. Right, right. Very cool. Very cool. Um, so so one of the things that that uh, is not obvious is, well, I mean, you, you talked about you sort of have a nonprofit and you you want to avoid certain IRS attention and things like that. But there are certain things that go on kind of in a sense behind the scenes. Mm. And and so I'm wondering how you're managing sort of like some schools have like they'll have their circle, which will be the 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 youth and the adults in the space immediately, and then they'll have another body that includes parents and may may like what I think it was Village Free School has has to have, just legal requirements means they have to have an adult board that handles this thing. Now they have um they had a nine year old as uh, chairing the meetings <laughs> because her mother was president of the board. Uh, so so they could include the children in a certain level, but legal responsibilities meant there had to be an exclusively adult board as well. So what are the kind of the behind the scenes things that make, make Embark work? That's a, another great question. So we try and pass as much down to the young people as possible, and that changes year to year. So hmm. when we talk about sociocracy, the biggest part is to not have a hierarchy, hierarchy right. not have anybody in charge, right, as power. But there is such a thing as hierarchy of perspective through mm -hmm. time. And so Andrea and I hold that line through time. So we are the ones that signed the lease and right. we are the ones that have access to the bank account. Now, everybody can have access to the bank account if they want it, if they want to be a part of that. But not everybody wants to do that kind of right. thing, right? So yeah. those are the things that we we do behind the scenes. I I kind of am a nerd about insurance. I love mm -hmm. insurance. So I will say who wants to, you know, come to an insurance meeting with me with the insurance, you know, the insurance broker that we have and and it is just me. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> But those things need to happen. Mimsy actually from Subray Valley wrote a great article about that, that mm -hmm. the staff really does hold that space for, for doing these things that keep the doors open. Right. It's not that the young people can't be a part of it, but it still needs to be done. Right. right? So, right. so yeah, so insurance and, you know, processing payment for, you know, for tuition. We also offer need-based financial aid. So we have a financial aid committee at mm -hmm. this time that's made up of board members. So we don't actually have any youth involved with that right now, not for any particular reason, other than it just has, it was structured that way from the beginning. We do have a board of directors and we have had members through the years that have been part of it. Mm -hmm. We're in the process of changing our board of directors structure to a sociocratic structure. Mm -hmm. It was originally set up as a traditional board structure with like Robert's rules of orders and majority rules. But we want to do the sociocratic method because one, it aligns with our values. Right. And two, it is a way to keep us safe from a rogue board. Right. Because there have been schools and centers that have had a rogue board. Yep. And with objection, it's one person can object right. right and then we work together as a team to fulfill the mission and the vision of the organization to integrate that objection so one person could stop that rogue board mm -hmm. which is that is a lot of power to be able to have with objection and when i've talked about sociocratic decision making before sometimes people will say to me oh isn't that tyranny of the minority and in a way, it's a gift of the objection, right? Mm -hmm. The objection mm -hmm. is like a broken toe. It's, it's telling you something is going on that you need to pay attention to. And we are not in competition with each other, you know, majority and minority, right? right, right. We are here as a team. So that objection is information. And right. how are we going to work with that? So that is something that we're hoping to do this summer is move into that sociocratic board structure too. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And part of that also includes more if they want to representation from the members to be a part of right, that too. Right, right. So yeah, that's how we have our board structure. But it's a really interesting way to think about we want to have this space be totally the young people's space, 
but we still need to process payments and right. you know <laughs> you know make sure we pay the rent and things like that exactly. but anybody can and be with us and do those things yeah and that's that's one of the things that that I think is a, an important point about all the ones that I'm aware of uh, and that I've asked this question of is is that I, I haven't met anybody who had any objection or and they would love to have you know, the youth the kids involved at every level and 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 even if they have to you know the i i'm pretty sure uh village free school currently has a youth representative we was interviewed um Nopawan and and kathy for last season but i'm pretty sure they met now <laughs> i don't know if i'm remembering correctly but but i think they have youth representatives they they may not have the legal vote yeah. On certain things, but they get the they you know do encourage and want the participation, and I found that's true of all the 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 schools in this space is, is that 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 there's no place the kids can't access. Mm -hmm. They just they just have to realistically realize you know like yes under 18s can't legally commit to certain kinds of contracts and things like that. Right. Yep. But but it is there there is a sensibility of like. If you include them in the process and, how, and and encourage them to participate in the decisions when they see value in it, when they recognize that, oh, this is really important to the continuing existence of the school or to, mm -hmm. to the school being healthy, then, then they will plug in uh, when, when that's, you know, fits with who they are. They absolutely yeah. do that. Yeah, yeah, they totally yeah. do. Yeah. And, and I think that, that, you know, that's an important part of, of like, like, thinking about the community as, as a pool of resources that, that should be available for the kids. I mean, that's mm. the ideal, right? And then that actually is another question is, how much do you, you said you have a lot of volunteers, how much do you kind of rely on community resources as a way to, you know, just be in the world? <laughs> oh, that's a great question too. I love these questions. The, what, well, I have a little bit of a subversive it rebel in me. So I love having the volunteers come in, not just for what they can share with the young people, but also so they can be in a space to see what it's like right, being right. run by young people, right? Mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. I love it when they can come in and be a part of this community and see, oh my gosh, these kids are playing unsupervised, right? <laughs> right? But, and they're okay. And they're, they're working out conflicts and they're navigating being here together. And this is amazing. And they, they get to choose what they want to spend their time with. And, and one of the things that I want to say is that even though we have people that come into our space as members that are like, I totally want to do this thing. I can finally study medieval Indian weaponry. <laughs> we have just as many people that are like, I don't know. I don't know what I want. I don't know who mm -hmm. I am. I don't know what to do. And so that's, you know, uh, we had a member describe it once, like we're holding the walls back of the, you know, the world or society so that they have that time and space to figure those things out within their minds that kind of is a theft when you're right. in public right. school. It's not kind of, it is, they, it is stolen from you. That inner life and that freedom to explore yourself mm -hmm. is gone. And so we definitely get people that don't know who they are, what they want. But to go back to the support from the larger community, I like to think that other cultures have more of a, a freedom with young people being outside within the community mm. than we kind of do in America with mm. like the let grow campaign, like let kids go out and play. And I really love our location in Leesburg. I love, except for that one time with the police officer, <laughs> we've only had one other issue. And that was one kid that would go to, we have a candy shop that everybody mm. can walk to, which is thrilling. And they had free hot chocolate. And so mm. he was struggling with cleaning up after himself. I don't, it wasn't anything other than he went in and made a hot chocolate. And he was so excited. He left without realizing he left this huge mess in a mm. store. And so they had asked different Emberg members they said, Hey, you guys can't come back anymore because of mm. this. And so we had a community, you know, that came up as an issue at one of our community meetups, which is how do we navigate this? And once again, and this is the thing that I really want to drive home. 
young people are kind people. They are not like Lord of the Flies, right? They care for each other and they want to work out problems. And yes, we make mistakes. And yes, we don't make the greatest choices sometimes. But instead of being angry, and there were people that were angry, they couldn't go back to the, the candy store. But it also was, how do we help? How do we help this person? What can we do to fix the harm at this candy store that was caused? Like, how do we fix this and how do we help this person? And that all came from them. Mm -hmm. That was not staff. And it just comes from within, just like the person that, you know, was struggling with being on the roof. It was, we want to give them a chance. We're willing to work on this. Mm -hmm. And so they came up with a plan, which was, okay, we're going to write an apology letter and we're going to talk to him and show him how to clean up. Maybe he doesn't even know how, maybe nobody ever told him this. And they pull all their money together and they bought flowers and they went back and they said, we're, we're, we want to apologize, but we also accept if you still don't want us to come back mm -hmm. and we're willing to accept that. But this is just nonviolent communication also has methods of complimenting and thanking people and apologizing. And part mm -hmm. of it is, this is what we, you know, observation. <laughs> this is how we felt. This is how it looks like you felt. These are your needs. These are our needs. And this is what we're going to do. And then how can we fix it? What can, what are your, what is your request from us? And, and we worked, they worked it out. Like staff wasn't involved with that. They all did it themselves. And, and eventually they were allowed to come back to the candy shop. And so to have a community that's also willing to, right. to trust them and, Shout out to the Sunflower Shack <laughs> that they were willing to let these kids make this mistake and accept their apology and give them the feedback and a request of what their needs are. That's what we're really grateful. And that just keeps coming up. So I think trusting kids mm -hmm. and also but trusting adults to, to trust kids too is something that I think is worth reflecting on. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nice. Nice. Very cool. Let's see. Checking my. Oh, uh, well, you kind of handle that. Oh, so so, so it, it sounds like you have sort of the the open screens policy. Has that uh, been just kind of the the constant, or is there has there been struggles with that? Has that been something? Another great question, and that the struggles with that usually comes from parents mm -hmm. more than the young people themselves. We consider screens like peter gray says a tool of our time and our culture mm -hmm. and so yes people use screens i i teach a couple classes at emmerich i i have a the crazy crimes class and inevitably we'll talk about what you know ten dollars in 1945 was worth and so I'm, I'm like can somebody please look that up mm -hmm. <laughs> you know i don't know what that is or um, can can, I don't know everything. There's no way I can know everything, right? So sometimes somebody will ask a question and it's enough to derail my thought process. It's easy for me to get distracted too. So I can bump that to somebody else. I'll say, okay, can you look that up, please? Mm -hmm. So we encourage people to, to use their, their screens and their devices the way that they need to. We've gotten a lot of feedback from people with anxiety mm. and people that are neurodivergent that the screens are very soothing. I had to have a major surgery a couple of years ago and I absolutely was playing Toon Blast, you know, right when I'm waiting in the waiting room because I was so freaked out. And so sometimes that is what people will use as a tool to sort of soothe themselves and calm themselves down. We have a lot of gaming that happens and a, a lot of the gamers stay together and they play together and they really are working together and collaborating right. together. So some of the challenges that we have with that is they can get really loud and really mm. enthusiastic and our building is 200 years old. And sometimes they'll, you know, they'll jump up and down and we're like, Hey, we're underneath of you and we would like <laughs> to stay you know, <laughs> underneath of you. So it's think conversations about, Hey, can you guys lower it? Or are there ways that we can problem solve around the volume of what you're doing? And then, you know, every now and then we'll have somebody that really stays on that screen. And then we'll check in and say, Hey, how are things going? How are you feeling in this space? And most of the time, what looks like being totally absorbed and checked out is somebody that's really paying attention. Mm. And it's a wonderful tool to be present but also appear like you're not present. So mm. we will see people that will be sitting in a corner and looking like they're playing Candy Crush and they are playing Candy Crush, but they're still listening to the conversation and they're mm. still part of it. And that is maybe their comfort zone. And that maybe that's their way of easing into the community. 
we do get parents that are like, oh my gosh, I'm so freaked out about screens. I'm afraid they're going to get addicted to it and all these other things. So we do do conversations about that. What we have found is when people restrict the screens, then they'll come to Embark and only do the screens. Mm. And so, because they're not getting fulfilled with that at home, they're going to eat it all up while they're with us from nine to three 30. And because they know when they go home, they can't do it anymore. Right. So that has been one of our observations for certain people that really have that need to play the video games or collaborate with people. And it really is very, very collaborative, but that is, that is one of the things we have noticed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's, it's, uh, and this is parallel to, to what, so, so in, there's a book called glued to games mm. by Scott Rigby and uh, Richard Ryan. And, and it really go, it, it was actually written around games specifically, but mm. I think it applies somewhat to the social media environment we're in as well, but, but to screens is that, that when you look at self-determination theory, what you're seeing there is like, there's something around the autonomy and the competence or even the relatedness where, okay, it's restricted at home. Then you get them, you know, screens are a place where usually it's the opposite is that there there's games are often designed to build on those needs specifically autonomy competence and relatedness they build on them in order to engage you and but that's that's a human getting a need met <laughs> you know and so what happens when you have an abundance of need support is that that's no longer an avenue that's not it the problem only arises when that's the only avenue for meeting those needs mm. Interesting. Yeah. And I, you know, I don't know much about the problems that, that people talk about that because I am sort of isolated in this other community <laughs> where people can choose what to do with their time. Right. And right, so, right. We, you know, you can put that down at any time that you want to and do something else. Right. And, um, you know, that's, that's intriguing for me because I really don't, spend as much time. I, I, you know, when I moved to Embark, I stopped teaching in public mm -hmm. schools. And so I'm not seeing any of that when I'm teaching in public right. schools because they cannot do any of those things. So yes, the fear that parents have that, that their child is going to stay on that screen all day. Yes. We have some people that stay on the screen all day, but they're talking with their friends and they still do other things and they can do other things. They have access to all the art supplies and all the science supplies and going into town and, you know, there's a Creek nearby and so they right, can do right. all these other things. I think the screens are also a big part of the de-schooling process for some people too, sure, sure. because like what you were saying with self-determination theory, it's like autonomy is there, right? Now I can do this thing and I am competent at this, man. I've got this thing. And even if I'm not, I can get there. And it's such a great way of having natural consequences, right? <laughs> right, right? Because like, if you can't get to that next level of the game and you're really angry about it, and you're, that game doesn't care. Right. There's right. nothing about that game that's going to emotionally connect with you. There's no, you can't do anything on your side of begging and manipulating or anything to get that game. You just have to do it. And then you can get to this place where you can make a choice. Like, you know what, this isn't worth it to me or, or what do I need to do to get there? Mm -hmm. And what are the resources that I can access to get there? So when right. you're at a place like Embark, you can ask a friend to help you with it. You can go online and ask somebody else, or you can read about it. This is just sad bitterness on my part as somebody that used to play Mario when I was, you know, in the 1990s, because I didn't have that. You had to go to like some weird flea market and find a magazine to find out how to get to the next place. And that's only if your mom gave you a ride. <laughs> so there's, there's so many more ways to, to build that connection and that relatedness, but also the autonomy and the competency. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, and once, once you start to realize that, that, the school, your embark can be that community in which they're fully supported, then then even if they're using the screens a large proportion of the time, it's an option that's available. It's not it's not defining them. It's not and it's something where the community itself is going to raise concerns if there's a concern about their health or their well being or or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's very really important. We're getting yeah. to the hour mark, so let's okay. Let's start where we began, or big end where we began, 
with some storytelling. <laughs> so tell me a story about a time when either someone or the or the school faced a challenge and mm. as a result of facing that challenge the school was better as a result mm. all right so this is going to be a school is better one okay so i'm going to change the one i was going to tell you so a couple of years ago somebody's phone disappeared and somebody's what disappeared their telephone their, oh, okay. their smartphone yeah. was gone and they looked through the whole building and they didn't know where it was and so the assumption was that somebody took it mm -hmm. and we had a, a mandatory meeting and this was a restorative circle and what we did is we all got together we our top floor is a loft area and it would have been the old attic mm. all this comfy furniture and pillows on the ground and so imagine you know 17 18 people up there because that's how many people we had at the time and we did rounds where you could pass, but I don't really think anybody did. And we talked about what the impact felt like mm. for the possibility that somebody's phone was stolen. And so everybody had an opportunity to say how that felt for them, right? So I felt scared or I felt really angry. And these are the reasons why. So we had, you know, somebody saying, I feel really disappointed that somebody at my community would take something that belonged to somebody else. And the person whose phone had been taken said, I just got here. Like I just enrolled. And so this is my welcome. It does not feel, I do not feel welcome. And this is really expensive and my family doesn't have the money to replace it and i so i feel really sad and angry and hurt and then other people were were saying well now i'm scared that my phone is going to disappear so we went around with all our feelings and we talked about our needs our need for safety and our need for connection and our need for community and our need for embark to stay open right mm -hmm. so if people would you know, go out into the world and say, this is that what happens at this crazy school because kids are allowed to be there and run it. And so we problem solved what to do. And so there wasn't any finger pointing because, you know, nobody knew some people had some ideas, but you never, we never truly knew. And it was, you know, the request of the community. And so they came up with an idea to put a basket in we our entrance way in the back our back entrance is a shed and so they put a basket we're going to just put this basket out there and then you know just maybe it'll show up in the basket no harm no foul it was the plan and then <laughs> it ended up not in the basket it ended up in a desk drawer where i hide candy <laughs> so mm. so andrea and i had a secret candy drawer at the time um, we have one now but i'm not telling you where it is but it was um, our secret candy drawer. And I went in there to get some candy like two days later and it was in there. And so it was returned mm -hmm. and, but it was an opportunity for everybody to experience what a restorative circle was. Mm -hmm. It was an opportunity for everybody to share what our community means to each other. And it was done in a way without judgments or evaluations it was just this is how i feel mm. and these are what my needs are here and how do we get to this place together mm. Mm. fascinating yeah yeah that's a really interesting <laughs> yeah cool so so for those who want to find out more about embark how should they do that well our website is embarkcenter.org www.embarkcenter.org and my email address you can send me an email at katina at embarkcenter.org c-a-t-i-n-a or you can just write it info at embarkcenter.org we are on instagram and facebook as well so if you want to see pictures of what we're up to our facebook is pretty active we share a lot of resources so we share mm -hmm. a lot of resources about self-directed education and um neurodivergent people in education and democratic education and sociocracy and things like that. We don't really do X or um, that other one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, so you can find us on Instagram and Facebook as well. Okay, cool. Awesome. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time. Thank you so much for having me. It was so lovely to talk to you. All right. <laughs> Thank you.
This has been the Agentic Schools Vodcast. I would love to hear from you. Please share what resonates with you from this episode. What do you think about schools that support children to exercise their agency on a daily basis? Agentic schools operate from within a new education paradigm. I wrote the Agentic Schools Manifesto to help you make sense of that new paradigm. The manifesto is available as a membership benefit when you join Deeper Learning Advocates for $5 per month or more. This vodcast is a co-production of Attituder Media and Deeper Learning Advocates. At Deeper Learning Advocates, we seek to embed the psychology of learning in policy so that policy stops undermining learning. The financial support of our audience is crucial to accomplishing that mission. You can find out more about the manifesto and join the cause at dladvocates.org. One final thing, I also offer a free course called Motivation Myth Busting for School Teachers. To sign up, visit holisticequity.org. Go to the Tools tab and click on Free Motivation Course. Thank you for your kind attention.